Hello and welcome to this Register webinar about the insider threat. Now, I once learned an expression which was never put down to malice what can be ascribed to stupidity. And I thought that must be such a great expression. It must have come from someone really deep and famous and so on and so forth. I actually traced it to a chef in New York, um, <laughs> which they should know. Um, but uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about this and we're going to be talking about the nature of the insider threat. And as the, as the expression suggests, it's not always down to bad people. It can be down to people that are doing things that they maybe shouldn't have done, but maybe they weren't thinking about it that much. And to help us talk about that topic, we have a, an esteemed panel of, uh, of experts. I think, uh, well, we all know what that term means, but uh, I'm going to turn to each of you. Uh, and uh, before I do, uh, I'd just like to say this is a, uh, a unique experience in the Register webinar series because uh, we're, we're coming to you both from the UK and from the US. So uh, we're here in London, myself and Tony, and, uh, and uh, we've got uh, Seth and Samir in, uh, in Boulder, Cor Colorado. And I know where I would rather be, particularly because <laughs> the beer is very, very good in Boulder, Colorado. So Samir and Seth, maybe start with you, Samir. And, uh, uh, introduce yourself and say what you'd hope people would get out of this uh, this panel. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, John. Hi, guys. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Samir Chan. Uh, I'm a senior product manager with Logarithm, uh, mostly responsible for uh, Logarithm's uh, UEBA solution, uh, as well as the SOAR and the security analytics component uh, of the platform. Uh, and, and we have uh, seen across our customer base that uh, uh, the urgency regarding the user base threat. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, we can discuss uh, the urgency of that problem and how we can uh, how we can help uh, with the data XFL uh, and as well as the other insider threats that we we, we often face uh, uh, in today's environment. Thank you, Samir. And over to you, Seth. Yeah, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Seth Goldhammer. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing uh, here at Logarithm. I've been in product marketing, product management roles in network security for really the last 20 years. And, you know, in all of that time, it's still the user who is always the weakest link in our security uh, and, and will continue to remain so. And so that's why this continues to be just a vital part of our conversation when it comes to network security. Tony, uses the weakest link? Always have been, always will be. Um, it's inevitable, both from you know doing accidental things, as you said, doing incorrect things because they didn't know any better, but also increasingly because the outside threats now target people inside the organisation as the first step in actually getting information out again. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of different things that are happening at once. So social engineering attacks is about finding the weakest link. Yes, and it's always people. Nearly so, always uh, people. Speaking of the weakest link, so uh, this is the agenda for, for today and uh, the first topic we're going to cover is that weakest link, the new face, the new user face of, of the insider threat. And we're going to look uh, about the costs of doing nothing, so uh, why, why this stuff matters and, and, and how, much cost and risk, 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 how much cost and risk that causes. And then what does a solution look like? So yes, of course, we've got, uh, we've got Logarithm here to, to talk about this, uh, but we're going to put that in the context of, uh, of uh, where to start and how to take the journey from a, a less, uh, I was going to say a less, a less more risky, no, a more risky environment to, to a less risky environment and, uh, and what you need to do in terms of people and process as, as well as technology. So maybe I can hand over to you uh, first, Seth, and uh, we, we can uh, just start to, to contemplate what kinds of issues we're talking about here. Yeah, there's, there's kind of three prominent use cases when people are thinking about the types of threats that can come from users. Uh, the first is insider threats. Um, you know, Gartner, uh, Gartner study found 62% of insiders were driven by a desire for a second stream of income. So you can imagine if someone came to one of your employees and said for a small, you know, small amount of money, uh, would you be willing to give me your credentials? Unfortunately, there's likely going to be an employee who's going to say yes to that question. Um, you know, if, if you don't recognize that fighter jet, uh, I'm, I'm not an aficionado on fighter jet, but that happens to be the F-15. Uh, the reason why I've got the F-15 there is because of the case of Hannah Roberts. Uh, Hannah Roberts mm -hmm. co-owned a defense company in India, and she worked as a U.S. defense contractor. Well, she uploaded schematics of the F-15 to a Camden County uh, church website and then emailed the credentials to her partner. They were going to sell those schematics out from her, from her own company. Uh, you know, unfortunately for her, fortunately for the U.S., this is one of the luckier stories where she was caught 
and she she was uh, given 57 months in, in prison as a result of that. Uh, in the middle, compromised accounts. Uh, you know, one of the um, main issues is yeah, you know, does a, an account that has valid credentials to your environment, but it's no longer being operated by you know that that person anymore. Uh, many of us are familiar with the Home Depot, you know, one of the largest retail breaches uh, at that time. But does any of you remember how they were actually infiltrated? Uh, it was an employee at their HVAC company, uh, Fazio Mechanical, uh, who actually fell victim to just a phishing attack. Uh, that phishing attack successfully installed a Trojan on his machine, and it was just a matter of time before they laterally moved to the business network where they're able to get to that HVAC's client uh, client. Uh, their clients, which mm -hmm. was uh, unfortunately Home Depot, was one of them. Uh, and then the last one, you know, privilege account misuse and privilege account abuse. Uh, you know, we we all handle sensitive data every day. Uh, imagine if you were the poor employee at Woolworths Australia who accidentally emailed out a spreadsheet to mm -hmm. thousands of customers that happened to contain over one million dollars in gift card information, as well as personal identifiable information personal identifiable information Easy for, you uh, to for more than 8,000 customers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not a good day when you've sent out that spreadsheet when you realize the distribution list you accidentally included on that one. So that took a bit of, of cleanup. Uh, so, you know, just, just as you, you talked about earlier, it, it, uh, these use cases are perpetrated not necessarily by, you know, sometimes by malicious intent, mm. but sometimes, you know, completely innocent people doing just unfortunate things. I, I read a whole thing about uh, the... Uh, uh, McDonald's uh, coffee cup monopoly mafia link. It was absolutely fascinating that the, the guy that was re responsible for securing the, the golden tickets actually started to, to, to take a few off. Then he started to take a few more off and in the end it became this kind of multi-million scam. Um, but that's uh, not relevant right now. Tony, is that... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it, it is relevant right now. It, it it, is. The last two are more the social engineering kind of aspect, aren't they? They, they are, but, but also th the first one, coincidentally, when you mentioned, you know, people might sell their credentials, you know, for small amounts of money. There, there's actually been lots of um, research carried out in railway stations, um, coach stations, where people have offered, you know, um, a bar of chocolate in return for, you know, give me your user ID and password at work. And a lot of people, because they don't actually understand what that might potentially be opening up, you know, just go ahead and do that, you know, for the bar of chocolate, not realizing that this could have serious consequences further down the line. So people, certainly the weakest link, as we said, you know, through malicious intent, through just lack of knowledge, as well as actually being targeted, and the targeting is getting more and more sophisticated. We're all getting emails now. It, Five years ago, it was really easy to tell, um, comparatively, that the vast majority of phishing attempts, it was simply, you know, that the, the text in the emails was very easy to see that it maybe wasn't written by a native speaker or they've got some credential wrong in there. And these things are really not working quite well. Uh, but now the targeting is such that it's so sophisticated and it's a whole industry rather than individuals perpetrating it. So everything mm -hmm. escalates, you know, day by day, week by week. You know, th those threats are becoming harder for people to perceive and see and actually realize when it's not a genuine email coming in. And, and presumably, Samir, it, it's uh, accessible. I mean, I can't remember what the right term is these days, but is it, is it bring your own device or consumerization or whatever people are talking about? But essentially, it's all fragmented, isn't it? When someone starts using their own Dropbox to... Uh, to share information. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, bring your own devices. So so the phones and the the iPads, uh, uh, and then being able to uh, share information using your personal box account for for example, right? So yeah, I think the the parameter is uh, no longer uh, contained within the network. Uh, we see that uh, the personal and the business, especially with uh, uh, with the trend around uh, more remote workers, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, yeah. the more global economy, right? So. Uh, so it's not uh, the perimeter is not contained anymore. Uh, it's uh, it's the devices, it's the location. Uh, all of it uh, is uh, is is a new challenge uh, for that weakest link. Mm -hmm. And you've got the whole ecosystem that that Samir has just described there. You've got people 
who no longer work directly for the company, so it's much harder to have that education so that they understand the consequences. We've got entire supply chains now built of you know subcontractors, people that are related to someone who's related to someone else, passed on, yeah, just business related. So that whole ecosystem mm. itself of the supply chain inside the organization is very, very fragmented. It's very difficult to defend against. Literally, there are no perimeters. We've recognized that for some time now. We, we've, we've actually got a question in, so uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, we've, we've got two questions in from the same person, uh, so from, questions from, from Sai, and uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to do, Sai, is ask one of those questions, uh, I'm going to ask your second question first, and I'm going to save your first question until the end, because it, it's more appropriate for then, so I'm going to hold that back, everyone. Yeah, I know you're all excited now, aren't you? <laughs> you're all excited to know what that's going to be, and I'm not going to tell you. Um, so the first question is, where does data loss fit into all of this? The reason is, I'm asking this, is my customers mostly think about data loss. That's my way into inside a threat. So uh, how much of this is uh, yeah, breaking system, and, and what proportion of this is actually related to data loss? Maybe, maybe I'll pass that one to you, Seth. Yeah, sure. Pre appreciate that. A great question. In, you can see in many of the examples that, that I'm presenting here that even though their users are kind of the the origination of that of that threat, uh, either they were a victim of or the perpetrator of. Uh, but to your point, in most cases, the end goal is some sort of data exfiltration. You know, Samir brought that up uh, earlier in his introduction as well. That you know the the data is what ultimately turns into dollars. And that's either being dollars sold for you know own personal wealth, or you know some hacker, some uh, some group is trying to trying to you know score some some money from your customer's personal identifiable information, from your customer's credit card information, et cetera. Uh, so that that's where I think that blur of kind of user activity and monitoring user activity and, and data loss prevention maybe maybe that's what you're picking up on. Mm -hmm. So. It what size also given us is a, a great segue onto the next slide, uh, because data loss prote pre pre prevention, sorry, is uh, is one of the items that people are actually investing in solutions for. Uh, Tony, maybe you can talk us through this because uh, we can see uh, DLP as uh, as a reasonable level of investment. Over a third, at least, have done yep. it, but not looking at users. Uh, exactly. Well, it's, it's a combination of things. Sometimes looking at users, sometimes looking at their business as a whole. Um, the sort of things on the list that you can see behind me are pretty standard to everybody, you know, starting with, you know, uh, attachment protection. That's been around for a long time, so that's why the numbers are quite high. But as you move down, uh, it's surprising, I think, to me that endpoint protection is still quite low on the list. Um, that, you know, given that that's been here longer than anything else is very surprising, but, but as you move down there, the anti-phishing has come up a lot recently. Um, the whole URL protection for drive-by infections, stuff like this is getting to be more and more prevalent, but DLP is in there, data loss protection, because as Seth said, you know, that's really what everything's about. It's about protecting your data, not letting someone have inappropriate access to it, you know, whether by accident or design. That, that's the ultimate goal of all security, whether that's your intellectual property, whether it's just stopping your systems sending out essentially money electronically to somebody. That's data going out the company um, and having a physical consequence that you're never even going to see. Um, unless you've got really good reporting in there to see it happening. But right at the bottom of the list, you've got two elements that everyone would think might be uh, something that we should be doing all the time. And when we talk to the register readers, you tell us that these are things you'd really like to be doing. Certainly the periodic testing you know, of user accounts or of code or of anything else, it's a big issue, but often time pressures or lack of budget mean that it's not performed as often as maybe we know we should, it should be. Uh, but even that's at a much higher level than at the moment, you know, activity profiling to understand, well, what's actually going on? Um, how do we know when something different is happening? And can we actually see which of those differences are genuine for a business need or which are maybe something a bit more suspicious that we need to dig into? It's right at the bottom of the list yet. Yeah, it's relatively new, but it's already on the chart. So there are people interested in this, but can we get there? How much effort is it to get there? These are the questions that the audience, you viewers now, tell us that you want to understand. And I, I think um, uh, if, if you're saying it's relatively new, it, it means that people haven't spent much money on it yet. And uh, so we've got that whole money question. I, I'm suddenly, where, where I'm trying to get to on this is, is uh, 
is it goes straight to the Cuba Gooding Jr. Tom Cruise scene in uh, uh, what was what's the name of the film? I can't remember now. What's it called? Come on, we can do this. Uh, Not the movie, though. Uh, Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Thank you very much. Good one, Seth. Okay, you get the first point for this webinar. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, so in Jerry Maguire, where they're on the phone and uh, and Cuba Gooding Jr. says, show me the money. And he has Tom Cruise screaming down the phone because this is what it's all about. When you're trying to find the finance for a security solution, you've got to actually illustrate in the dark that, uh, that the, there's, there's a problem to be solved and that it, it's actually more expensive to leave it uh, unsolved than it is to solve it. So, so maybe you can talk us through uh, uh, this, this particular slide, Seth, uh, around, because you must be having these conversations with your customers all, all the time about, should I do it? Do I really have to do it? Does it matter? Um, actually, I might have Tony speak to yeah. the cost of doing nothing because uh, I sure. think he's more averse on this particular slide, and then I'll, I'll um, I can probably take it up from there. Okay, well, you can pick up on the point about how hard is it to to actually uh, yeah. be, well, be it is convincing for sure. Yeah, you know, you know, how how do you know that Sheila in accounting is no longer Sheila in accounting? Uh, so I, you know, there it, there is uh, absolutely a challenge here. Uh, and, and that is why I think it's been very difficult. I think what you've seen you know, on, on the previous slide you showed, uh, we've, we've tried a myriad of different tools. And I mm -hmm. think in security, we've been, we're very tool focused. Um, we try to kind of, what is the latest tool to kind of go solve a, a, a problem? Uh, and I think what we're seeing with, you know, when it comes to users, it's a bit more systemic than, than a tool. Uh, and, and that's why we are looking for a, a, a broader technology approach that allows us to make that recognition of, you know, is Sheila Sheila in doing the things that we expect Sheila to do, or is Sheila doing something very different? And as a result, we need to, to, to take recognition of that. It's always Sheila, isn't it? T Tony, cost of doing nothing. Yeah, I mean, this, page, this chart is an accumulation of different surveys that we've executed with the audience um, and the, the feedback they've given us on this. So, so it's buying security solutions can be extremely difficult for organizations, but just making the budget case because as Seth just said, people have got technology, they've been buying technology for years and years and when you go along and make Surely them, it's enough, right? and you say, we need something else, people mm. say, but look, you know, you, you spent X last year or the year before or you know, even two months ago, so why do we need something new? And it comes down to, well, what's the actual risk of not doing security as well as you can? Um, and some of them are pretty obvious, you know, so when we've been infected or when we've had a threat that has appeared inside the organization and we know that something's happened, obviously there's the immediate costs of dealing with that, so just remedying everything. Potentially though, there's now more and more the likelihood of getting fines coming in. And some fines, you know, especially with the European changes to GDPR, are potentially amounting to 4% of worldwide revenues. That makes life you know, much more interesting for the executive board that have got to approve everything. It focuses so the mind, it, doesn't it? Yeah, um, the, the threat of losing 4% of your worldwide revenue, not just in one particular location, and not your profits, um, it's not like tax, mm. it's not your profits, it's the revenue, then that has had an impact on lots of those board level execs because they're the people well, carrying I, the can. I guess suddenly from it being intangible, uh, kind of it could cost you money, it's kind yeah. of this is the figure, this is how much it's going to cost, uh, that 4% equates to X and therefore X is Significant. Significant. Yeah, it, it's changed from being, well, you know, security solutions for IT, that's an insurance buy. You know, mm. do we need the insurance or not? Mm. Yeah, some insurance we've absolutely got to have, but maybe not all of it. Uh, now, though, that's beginning to change things. And it's not just the GDPR legislation. Similar legislation is happening around the world. Um, but then there are some of the softer areas to define. So reputational damage. This is something that, you know, many large organizations have experienced over the last few years following incidents where where their data has been lost or taken. Mm -hmm. um, there's been incidents in the last couple of weeks of which I was a victim of one of them um, with, with a large airline. So these things happen, but it's the brand impact that can have long-term consequences, which impacts the shareholders as well. Never mind getting regulators maybe looking at us more closely. As, as, so, as someone's just pointed out, and uh, I'm going to throw this, uh, this question open to the floor and, and see who picks up on, on, on this question. Uh, We've got the cost of doing nothing. We've also got the cost of doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just uh, buying a tool, which we're going to nope. get to. But uh, um, as, as the question says, if I may say, the biggest problem with user profiling is it's very hard. 
and uh, and so it's not just y y of course you can come along and say well we've got a way of doing it but it's also very hard I would imagine I'm getting to the question bear with me it, it's also very hard to get across that it can be simplified because people know how hard it is to I mean as, as the guy says uh, as the person says uh, uh, people are strange. How on earth are we meant to identify when they're being strange in a dangerous way, <laughs> given the fact that people are strange normally anyway? So uh, uh, I see you nodding there, Seth. Uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right. We have a, we're, oh, sorry, we're sorry. very diverse. You know, the, the way that we, we interact with the network, there are some groups that interact with the network. You know, our, my R&D team, they're, they're, they're going to be fairly similar uh, in, in a day-to-day -day and as a peer group. If I look at my sales team, you know they're they're traveling all the time, coming in from very you know different locations, very bench. various times of day, right? So yeah, you have all that variety uh, in in th that occurs just within our our networking on a regular basis, and couple that with you know if I take a, a, a machine learning, uh, and we'll get into technologies a little bit in this in this discussion, but if I take kind of a, a common machine learning use which is I want to look for what you do in the, and, and then score what you're doing today against the last 30 days. Well, if you open up Notepad for the first time in 30 days, none of your peers use Notepad. From an algorithm perspective, algorithms don't know what Notepad yeah. is. It just knows that's something new that you've done. But we all know that has no security relevancy. And so I, I think the biggest fear when it comes to user profiling is the false positives. I'm going to be yep. alerted to all these anomalies that are true anomalies, but they're not security relevant, and that's the challenge. Uh, it, it might suggest we have a Luddite, which could be an issue in its own right, but uh, may, maybe not so much from a security perspective. So, Samir, I, I noticed you also uh, uh, may be interested in adding to this. Yeah, to add to what uh, Seth said, right? So, so yeah, the, the, ch the challenge is, uh, is huge, uh, profiling a user, especially the pattern of the user changing all the time. Uh, the good news is that we, we can uh, do multi-level, uh, multi-layer uh, analytics to understand the difference between uh, anomalous behavior versus the uh, versus an actual threat, right? So, uh, true. So, so that's the challenge uh, between uh, certainty and insight, right? So, getting an insight into the user behavior uh, versus being certain that uh, it's a it's an anomaly versus a threat, right? So, uh, it's a huge challenge, uh, but it's also a, a very interesting challenge, uh, especially with all the. Uh, the technologies that we have available today uh, to get to be able to solve that challenge is also very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to stick with you, Samir. It's your big moment because it's the product slide coming up right now, uh, and uh, there, there's a build on it. But I'm going to go straight, straight through, straight through it all. And and uh, here's six areas you mentioned: analytics, um, and these are all areas of the solution. But which would you say are the kind of the the big? Uh, the, the big tent stuff that's, that's really changing the way that we can think about uh, uh, behavioral analytics. Yeah, so uh, so behavior uh, analytics, right? Uh, trying to understand uh, the pattern of my activities, uh, the time of uh, day I log in, uh, the location I log in from, the devices I used. Uh, how do I compare my behavior to my behavior over the last uh, 30 days, six months? Uh, how do I compare uh, the behavior, my behavior against my uh, dynamic peer, right? So that's some of the some of the behavior profiling that can give us uh, uh, the insight into the behavior uh, by having a different benchmark uh, for comparison, right? So uh, so that's the behavior component. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is the the scenario component, right? So uh, we all understand uh, a number of challenges that we face, uh, which is very specific to my organization, right? So uh, different scenarios, uh, different uh, stories. Uh, the known knowns, right? Uh, so to be able to uh, recognize those uh, changes, those scenarios uh, in a real-time uh, behavior or real-time pattern uh, is also getting very critical, right? Just so so we can lock down certain scenarios uh, in real time without having to worry too much about uh, about those aspects that we already know about. So are, are we essentially are we essentially looking for anomalies here? Is this, is this looking it's what it for comes the down to. abnormalities? Yeah, it's what it comes down to. But but as the questioner asked or said, you know, people are so different. So actually identifying what is abnormal behaviour 
is the, the core of everything, and particularly, as both Seth and Samir have said, avoiding false positives. You know, avoiding false negatives is also good, um, but, but avoiding false positives is the thing that can really um, impact on users, because if they're suddenly blocked from doing something that's perfectly valid, we all know what users are like. You know, they're going to complain. At the very least, they're going to complain if they're not going to try and work around whatever it is that we're, we're trying to stop them from doing, because we think that it's unusual. So getting those false positives down to the absolute minimum, but also when we do get any positive, whether it's false or real, having the communication with the user so that they understand exactly you know, why whatever action we're taking happens is key to this. You know, rather than just blocking whatever it was they were trying to do without an explanation, we've got to communicate with them to let them know, hey, look, this has been stopped because of X. You know, someone's going to get in touch with you, or if it's real, it's a bit like when you do some authentication with a new application or a new system when you're trying to buy something and you're using a new machine and it asks you to authenticate in some other fashion to say, is this really you doing this? Is there a good reason for it? That's where we need to get that communication going on all positives. Mm. Uh, 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 I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because I'm thinking we're not robots, for one thing. Uh, and, and we, So anomalous behavior is kind of my day. <laughs> it's a, I kind of do something I didn't do yesterday just because I would and, and uh, you know, more seriously in an innovation kind of environment you, you almost want people to do things that are, are not like what they did the day before uh, and the other side so we're, we're not robots but also the other side of it is people aren't going to thrive under a kind of set of speed camera type bureaucracy uh, that, that, that's quite constraining so, so uh, Seth maybe to you how, how, how do you balance the need to kind of spot um, strangeness, as, as one of our questioners say, and at the same time open to innovation? Yeah, you know, you know we, we talk about the, the, um, how different we are, how, how, we, how much we kind of uh, change how we act on the network. Uh, on the same hand, we are creatures of habit. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so we can learn, even from an individual, uh, you know, what are the times of day they generally come onto the network? What are the types of systems they log in from? Where do they go to? What types of applications? And we're not doing that because we're a big brother. We want to know how long are you spending on the business application versus uh, going to uh, you know, you know um, looking up some some news or something like that. We're doing it because we just we just want to know how you interact with the network. Uh, if you have if lots of variety, we're going to learn that you have lots of variety, and that mm -hmm. becomes a natural trait of yours versus someone who has less variety. So all, that, that level of variance is something we can track. Uh, also, just uh, you know, getting kind of the left side of the screen, the, the, the type of data we can pull in uh, does need to be optimized for analytics, meaning we can't just take in a bunch of data uh, and then assume that our analytics can just work flawlessly and make you know, pinpoint recognitions. We do need to prepare data for analytics. And what that means is if we're taking a variety of different data, we do need to prepare it so that the, the algorithms, they can, they can listen to that. They can consume that in a way that is appropriate for that algorithm. So if I'm trying to learn variants, I, I know where are all the systems you're logging in from with a common way to recognize that. So that, that data preparation becomes a critical step. Otherwise, it's sort of garbage in, garbage out, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, we, this actually leads to a question which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put to you, Samir, because uh, it, it's a... Uh, I'm sure you're both able to answer technical questions, but uh, I'm going to put it to Samir anyway, um, which is around uh, time frames. So um, do I read all of this out? Um, uh, if you've got a range of machine learning algorithms in here, tipping out alerts, what's the average learning curve we can expect in terms of time frames? And, uh, and uh, there was another question about how does resourcing apply over time, but maybe we'll get to that, that later. We'll, we'll, we'll save that one up. But in turn, I mean, presumably it takes a few days, weeks, hours. How, how long does it take to start to build a picture of an organization? Uh, it typically uh, it typically takes uh, 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 at least a week uh, to try to understand uh, the weekly profile of a user, uh, and and then uh, uh, and then uh, we 
the, the machine learning uh, uh, becomes better and better uh, the more data that we have uh, across uh, weeks and and, uh, uh, and 30 days, uh, for example. Uh, 30 days a uh, monthly uh, data is uh, is typically a good uh, a good amount of data to understand the behavior across uh, uh, the weekday as well as the the monthly task uh, but then obviously the more data we have the the analytics become uh, a lot better uh, because we have seen that data mm. we can classify uh, as anomaly or not right so so yeah I, I would say uh, we start getting better and better results uh, starting week one right end of the week one is when we we at least have a good profile of a user and then as uh, more weeks uh, data we get uh, the the ml becomes a lot uh, lot better in able to uh, identify uh, not only the anomaly but to understand the 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 threat uh, context of that anomaly as well so in, in week one we're all bad guys right week two only half of us by week three or four then uh, then we're starting to really weed out the wicked here Absolutely, uh, because week one, uh, everything is new to a machine learning algorithm, right? So we do not know whether it's a normal behavior or not. Uh, so yeah, exactly. I mean, week one, everybody everybody has a very high score, a very high risk profile, mm -hmm. uh, but things uh, start getting normalized as the <laughs> as we have more data. I'm just imagining people looking at your system, going, "Oh my God, everyone's terrible!" But then it all calms down. After it it all, all all gets better. Yeah. You've also got the effect of large numbers when you're applying this inside a big organization. Mm. You've got a lot of data coming in very quickly. So, so getting some idea of baselines, you know, happens quite quickly. But, but as Samir said, the more information in, the bigger the learning um, data set, then the better it becomes, you know, as long as you've got the right profiling wrapped around it. I mean, I, I'm presuming that it's better to, I mean, essentially, should someone buy your stuff in kind of June or September rather than, uh, you know, any of the holiday periods when things are just going to be different anyway? Uh, as Seth uh, pointed out, right, I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, uh, what uh, what uh, uh, the month uh, it is uh, uh, because uh, machine learning uh, does not un understand the timeline, right? It's all the data that we are getting. Uh, so even within that month, right, if there is a lot of variance, uh, as Seth pointed out, uh, machine learning uh, tries to understand the variance uh, and, and and try to rationalize whether it's the it's it's an actual threat or not, right? So so yeah, obviously uh, the more time that we have uh, in respect of, of the month, I think uh, it just gets uh, better and better. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I've got a question here as well. Um, uh, is the objective to model changes in my behavior? Asks the questioner. Or is it to model my behavior versus someone else's behavior? How, how, how does it work out? It's both, really, right? So uh, my behavior uh, over a course of time, uh, over months, uh, versus the my behavior against uh, against the other people who are similar to me, right? So not relying on certain groups or not relying on Active Directory, uh, but being more dynamic in nature, right? So maybe one week uh, I, I look lo look like more like a sales engineer uh, from one parameter, right? The travel habit. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I might look more and more like an engineer based on the host that I I access, right? So I think it's both uh, understanding your behavior in in context of your behaviors against the, your dynamic peers, for example. Keep those questions coming, guys, because. Uh, um there's lots of them, and, and we really appreciate them. And before I ask any more questions, because otherwise we're not going to we're not going to get to the end of this, uh, I'm going to shift on to the next slide, uh, which is about a lot of these topics, which is about this identity-based approach. Uh, so um, tell it. I mean, Greg looks like a nice guy, doesn't he? he he's he's all right. He's not going to do anything wrong, is he? Uh, doing uh, UEBA well requires us to analyze uh, data in the context of an identity. Uh, for example, this uh, wonderful user, Greg Smith, uh, uh, he's a DevOps uh, director, uh, but he has uh, multiple accounts, right? He has uh, one or more AD account. Uh, he may have a number of uh, SaaS account, AWS, GitHub account. Uh, and, and these uh, accounts are represented differently in the logs and the network tra traffic that we get, right? Uh, so the idea is to look at uh, Greg as, uh, as a whole, uh, as an as a identity construct, uh, uh, because none of these credentials actually identify the user Greg Smith, uh, right? So the challenge is, uh, uh, do, we, do we look at uh, Greg Smith in the context of uh, his uh, uh, GitHub account, Lone Star, or his uh, Greg Smith's uh, work account, or do we 
want to analyze all of it uh, together into one identity construct. Uh, so that's the that's the advantage is to look at as a user as a whole uh, and then try to understand uh, uh, maybe uh, Greg uh, Smith used the domain account to log into his laptop, uh, but then he transferred uh, some file using his personal email address uh, uh, just to share uh, some details, right? So to be able to understand uh, all of it within the identity construct, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, just to make the analytics more efficient. Mm -hmm. Uh, Seth, anything to add to that? No, I, I, I mean, I think Samir is, is spot on. We, we do need to look at, you know, not just individual accounts, but, you know, getting back to understanding kind of, you know, what are all the activities and how I interact with the network uh, across all those different activities. You do have to recognize uh, the user as, as a person and not as individual accounts. Otherwise, you are going to introduce blind spots into your analytics. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, as a former IT manager myself, um, I'd be interested to know just how easy it is for the organization to actually put together all of these different identities and say that that is one person rather than two people. How much input do you need physically from the folks there versus you know, it happening automatically? Generally, yeah, there are receiving this information from, from identity access stores. Uh, so it's not that we have to go and uh, you know, create a big project to pull this information in. Uh, if we don't have personal email addresses, if, if there's information that we're missing from the list, that's okay. You know, we're going to take what's kind of readily available, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, and with that, and generally those are going to be all your business systems. Uh, yeah. but, and even just Active Directory, if I take just the one example, uh, in Active Directory, uh, in Windows events, my account can still be represented very differently. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes yep. I'm domain slash user, sometimes it's my email address, sometimes it's just my account name. Uh, and if we we're, uh, if our analytics wasn't prepared, uh, we would potentially look at all those as three different users and perform analysis against that as three distinct accounts. Uh, so having that identity construct just allows you to collapse all of that so that you can truly understand that user's behavior and not, not individual accounts or even representation of that account. So when you know someone uses that personal ID that maybe we don't have in the corporate accounts, do you automatically pick that up so that you can say, hey, look, this is initiated from the machine that we know belongs to Greg, and therefore we're going to make the assumption that it's him or we're going to check with him? Is that automatic or do the IT guys really need to get involved at that level? You know, the, the, the risk of some sort of inference is is a confidence factor, yep. right? So if, if I say, well, I think this is Greg Smith because maybe I'm doing some fuzzy logic and it looks like mm -hmm. a G Smith, or I think that, you know, Greg just logged into the system, so this is probably Greg Smith. Now I'm introducing uh, some sort of uh, potential that I'm wrong. And you're yeah. already dealing with an indeterministic model. So you already have... You know, I'm already trying to recognize anomaly and security relevancy, which may or may not always be right. And now I'm introducing another vector, which is I may not even have the identity right. Uh, so we would propose, you know, when using an indeterministic model, let's at least assure that all the variables going into that deterministic model are very well known and high confidence factors before we start introducing even more unknowns into the equation. So it's a setup process you have to go through. So, sorry, say it, say it again, Tony. It's a setup process you have to go That's through. That's right. It, it is a setup process, uh, yeah. I, I, I feel really bad. I feel really bad because we've got a question from Steve, which we've already answered. Um, so <laughs> sorry, Steve, for uh, for not uh, actually doing my job. Uh, well, Tony's already doing my job now, so I, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to leave the room. Uh, so uh, Steve actually asked the question, how does my activity within the different business applications that I use get factored into, into my profile? And, and I, I, I think we, we've, we've kind of covered that. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask another question, though, at this point, uh, and as we, as we flick onto, onto the next slide, which is around the data uh, within this. And I, I, I'm presuming that, Samir, you're, you're going to be picking up on the, on the deep dive data stuff. Uh, That's but the, right. The, the question is, is higher level as well, though, so I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide who's going to answer it. Um, or maybe I'd just better say, Seth, you answer this. Uh, yeah. What about privacy? Uh, is the question. So, um, uh, how does employee privacy uh, come into the picture or does it? Are workers simply, simply told, we're watching you every second and if you don't like it, hit the road? Uh, <laughs> how, how, how do you manage that with uh, uncomfortable yeah, uh, clients? It's, 
Well, it's a, it's a fair question for sure. You know, what, what we have seen, what, which is interesting in the industry, is that there really hasn't been a, a, that much of a backlash against privacy. Uh, and I think because most users understand, again, this, this is not a big brother monitoring model where we want to know what you're doing so that we can say, hey, get back to work. You're not spending enough time being productive. It's it, we're, we're trying to find bad guys. We're trying to find bad people who are doing bad things on, on the network, you know, looking for nefarious type of activity. Uh, and so I, I think given that that objective, most people understand the, the, the role of or you know, the, the goal of the, the user monitoring program. Um, now, with that said, you know, can we do things in an anonymized fashion? You know, can we do things where you know, the security team, they don't know if they're necessarily investigating the CEO or you know, someone in, in, in the post room. Uh -huh. yeah, sure, we, we can operate in, in, in a model where we're protecting privacy, but still allowing for those, those security relevant changes in behavior uh -huh. to be investigated. So, uh, and presumably you know, from everything that you've said up to this point, we're, we're, we're looking for things, uh, a high probability or a high level of confidence that something is seriously not usual. Uh, and, and so if someone has logged into Greg's account and they start doing things that Greg wouldn't normally do, uh, as opposed to Greg just um, goofing around. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, stop. yeah, that's right. I mean, every, yeah, we, we, we do everything in terms of risk relevancy. We're is, exactly we're again, we're not trying to help organizations create a user monitoring program. We're trying to create uh, a mechanism where we're looking for risky activity uh -huh. with security relevancy. Uh -huh. That's exactly right. So onto onto the data, Samir. Uh, I'm going to stick all of this up. Uh, you've got lots of data sources, haven't you? Don't don't, don't please don't go through every one of these. Uh, but uh, I, I would. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do do tell us about uh, how you're using data. Yeah, absolutely right. So it all starts with uh, data and and uh, having. Uh, prepared that data that's uh, optimal for uh, machine learning and uh, security analytics. Um, so we have uh, uh, we have uh, 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 what we call the uh, machine data intelligence fabric called MDI fabric uh, that optimally Snappy. prepares the uh, optimally prepares the data for uh, logarithm uh, UEPA. Uh, and, and there are a number of uh, unique uh, data features that uh, that makes the, the algorithms a lot better. Uh, starting with uh, being able to have a, a uniform uh, data schema uh, uh, so, so, the, so that we can have an abstraction layer between uh, specific technologies, right? So uh, Checkpoint versus Palo Alto, uh, they look the same. Uh, Windows versus Linux log sources, right? Uh, so when analyzing data, it's important that uh, a drop packet is a drop packet. A failed login is a failed login, uh, irrespective of where that faked failed login happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, another data feature is the is the classification, right? To be able to uh, uniformly classify the the thousands of log sources that we that we get access to, right? So uh, that also helps uh, in optimally preparing uh, that data. Uh, and and flicking, talk, uh, to, flicking to the benefits then. Yeah, from the benefit side, I mean, uh, we definitely want uh, to make sure that there is a consistent uh, representation of data, uh, just so that the machine learning uh, becomes a lot better. Uh, there was a recent study done uh, in one of the machine learning uh, or data science uh, magazine uh, that a lot of time uh, uh, is spent by the data scientists uh, optimally preparing that data. The figure was close to an 80%, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as you can imagine, uh, the better data, the, the consistent data that you have uh, makes uh, the, the analytics more and more efficient, uh, just streamlines the entire uh, operation for UEBA. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I'm going to actually ask a question from Steve before we've answered it. It may be a different Steve, so uh, I've failed for one Steve, but I'm going to succeed for the other one. Or it may be the same Steve, in which case I, I hope I've uh, redeemed myself. So Steve, at what level of sophistication, and it's a perfect segue as well to the next slide, so at what level of sophistication is UEBA, which is, uh, yeah, 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 I can't remember what that means. So you can, you can tell me what that means again. Uh, I know it's behavioral analytics, it's the UE that's eluding me for a second. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1, where UEBA is in its infancy, versus 10, where UEBA is at its peak of usefulness. Uh, where, where are we so, with UEBA? Yeah. Uh, so UEBA is a user and entity behavior analytics. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I, I would say uh, 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 it, it is becoming uh, more and much more mature 
Uh, so I, I would say uh, it, it's probably uh, a, a six or a seven uh, on the on the on the the maturity cycle of the of the, the typical product life cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, and to get there, uh, we we you have uh, three three. St oh, I jumped ahead too far. There we go. Back up, back on this one. Uh, I thought it was a build. Um, so. Uh, uh, there's three things you need to do to get to that six, seven out of ten level, and then build on top of that. Um, uh, maybe, maybe uh, well, I'll, I'll let you guys decide who, who's who's going to talk us through these these three steps. I can I can take a first stab at it. So so we talked uh, uh, some of it already. Uh, so UEPA in three simple steps, right? So one is. Uh, uh, the data, it's all about the data and being able to associate that data uh, for understanding the who uh, for uh, as many log messages, uh, network uh, traffic uh, packets as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then to be able to answer a question like, uh, does this uh, log have an identity or it can be related to an identity, right? Here's where the, the inference comes in. Uh, and then uh, step two is really being able to identify the anomalies uh, in that data, right? Uh, uh, is it uh, is it uh, is it is the pattern known to be bad, right? Uh, is the uh, identity usually behave this way? Uh, and we can do uh, the anomaly detection uh, through a number a number of different uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, scenario-based analytics, uh, a hybrid uh, behavior-based approach. Uh, and then step three really is to uh, to determine if it's actually a threat, right? Uh, and we can do that by bringing in the additional context into the mix, uh, uh, bringing in the IOCs, uh, bringing in the the past behavior, uh, and then being able to do a, a entire threat lifecycle management, right? Being able to take action, uh, automating as much as possible uh, within the the SOC uh, SOC guidelines, right? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. To be able to answer the question like, is this actionable? Uh, here is where the the SOAR components uh, come into play, right? As Tony mentioned earlier, uh, having the playbooks, uh, being uh, able to educate the user, uh, all of that uh, comes into play into the into the third step here. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Tony, I've I've got a question uh, uh, from Barry here. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and it's it's a very these questions are getting longer and longer. I think you're all in cahoots uh, to, uh, putting these questions together. Uh, but the long and the short is. Uh, the bottom line is about Big Brother, uh, and uh, uh, how do employers and employees, how should they relate to each other, particularly if productivity is good uh, and employees are still watching cat videos, but they're still you know, producing, producing great work. Should you just kind of go, hey, it's a cat video, crack on, or, or how can you manage that balance? Well, that, that comes down to management skills anyway, and, and to a degree, the culture of the company. So there are some companies that would be really against watching cat videos just on general principles because they're dog people. Um, but, but the big thing here is, you know, as you say, does it impact productivity? If the productivity is still you know, at least good enough, if not getting better, then who cares? Um, but it comes down to that culture side. But the interesting thing is, um, I think as an IT guy, um, how much horsepower do we really need to put into this to make it work? How close to real time is it? And can we actually get this information back quickly enough to make a difference? Is that something that you've got something to tell the audience here? Actually, Tony, that might be a great segue into the, into the next slide. we we'll kind of talk about, uh, we, we've talked a bit about uh, scenario-based analytics and behavior-based analytics yep. and, and really wanted to kind of use the slides to kind of help express why we feel that's pretty important that you have different techniques in use. Um, you know, we talked about the different use cases. In this slide, we're talking about the different types of users. And we, we've been talking about that since the beginning. You know, we've got, you know, the careless user who, uh, the, the accidental user all the way to the, the intentional user. And, and what we're finding is that the attack types, you know, you're going to see more commodity type malware on the left side of the spectrum, yep. getting to more, you know, spear phishing, you know, real targeted malware on the right side, or just abrupt behavioral change. And so what we have found is that, you know, having appropriate analytical techniques across the spectrum is going to be the most effective. You know, if, if it is just sure. commodity malware, we've seen it before, we know what the exploit looks like, we can recognize that scenario mm -hmm. immediately as it happens. We don't need to use machine learning where we might miss it. We might not have the degree of, of confidence that we've recognized something, or even worse, we're, we're required to use supervised learning, right? Where we have to tell the machine, yeah, that's this type of threat. No, it's not. Yeah, it is that type of threat. No, it's not. I mean, that's 
And we see yeah. there are vendors in the market today that that's exactly their approach where you've got months and months of, of training the algorithm. So our approach is let's use kind of the right tool for the right job uh, and have the right analytical technique where we can have immediate feedback given known scenarios. Uh, we can recognize abrupt behavioral change when that's appropriate and have the ability to corroborate across and that's where we get to that, that security relevancy. Okay. And uh, I, th I think if we if we move straight on to the the next slide as well, because you're talking about the the tools that you have for scenario an analytics there. I, I did have a question earlier, which which, which uh, I, uh, I I wanted to ask, and I'm not quite sure when to ask it, so I'm going to ask it now anyway. And it's probably aimed at you, Samir, uh, which is around integrations. So, sure, your your systems can can pull data from a variety of sources. Can they also push data into a variety of endpoints like uh, HR systems or or whatever, or, or do you get a, a dashboard for for your stuff? How does it work? So yeah, we can uh, we can uh, pull in uh, a lot of log sources. Uh, we can also have uh, 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 the log sent uh, to us as well. Uh, you mentioned uh, HR system, uh, wherever that uh, user data is stored, uh, and that's extremely important for getting that context right. Is the user uh, about to leave the company, for example, right? So, so yeah, we we can support uh, a variety of log sources, a thousand plus log sources, uh, either a pull or a push, uh, and then we we get uh, a different log sources just for the the additional context, uh, uh, maybe a uh, maybe a, a thread grid, for example, or uh, or maybe maybe the HR system, or maybe uh, the 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 integration, the IAM system. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, it's a mix of uh, push and pull. Uh, just to get all the the required uh, log sources to make it uh, a, a little bit better. Okay, so you you bring you bring some algorithms into the party, and you can plug. You don't need to answer that. Uh, but there is another question, which I'm going to aim. At, uh, uh, I'm just stating the obvious here. Uh, uh, I'm going to aim this at, uh, at you, Seth, um, uh, which is a really interesting question because it actually kind of plays with the algorithmic nature. So I'm going to flick onto the next slide, which is around that scenario analytics. Let me do that. There we go. But then I'm going to ask, here's a scenario that someone's come up with, which is a growing on-demand slash contingent workforce. So people are coming in, they work for a week or so, and, and then they go. They're, they're, they work in privileged uh, account kind of roles, mm. but then they're in, in inevitably going to be higher risk. Um, and also part of the risk is you don't have a month necessarily to, to train to train your software to, to spot what they might be doing wrong. So it's a genuine concern for, from, from one of our listeners and, and watchers. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you look at um, staff turnover kind of challenges? Yeah, no, that's, you know, staff turnover, also just guesting, right? You know, that's one of the major concerns is you have the contractors, the guests that you're bringing onto your network, as you as you mentioned, or as the question mentions, transient in nature. You know, so how are we going to get to to learn their uh, their behaviors? And I think that's you know, what we're looking for is one. This is where peer grouping can help. Where yep. one of the things that we're looking for with guesting is, you know, are they they're just new. But, in, but they're going to systems in a way that we see others behaving, or are we seeing them, they're new and we're seeing lots of access denies, lots of authentication failures, right? They're, they're trying out you know, where they can get this account you know, in terms of lateral movement. So there, there definitely are behaviors that can start to separate. This is a new person just doing new things versus this is a, a new a, a account on the system that is actually doing nefarious things. We can also just look for temporary accounts and that's just a scenario, right? You know, an account gets created, escalated privileges and deleted all within a short period of time. I don't need machine learning algorithms to recognize that. That's just A plus B plus C. Mm. Uh, so again, let's use the, the right technique to learn or you know, to, to, to recognize appropriately. For, for some reason, I'm reminded of the difference between a Labrador and a Spaniel. Um, so uh, uh, La Labradors do what they're told largely and Spaniels don't do what they're told largely. <laughs> But you know, one's a Labrador and one's a Spaniel, so you kind of expect it. Uh, That's right. So uh, yeah, right. it's also you know the statistics of large number sets again. So mm -hmm. you've got a lot of people that you know should be working in a particular way. If someone new comes in and they're working in a way that's really out of the ordinary for this particular job type, because you're employing someone in the job type, so you've got that correlation already on the identity and the role and everything else. So that helps to a large degree. If they're really doing something unusual, are they in a new job? 
doing something that's special, just a one-off contract or something, yeah. or are they supposed to be doing this? And again, that's stuff that you can work into a process. And that's a Absolutely, Tony. Maybe just add to that really quickly. Um, th this is also where context becomes extremely yeah. important, where uh, yeah, I have a, a new person doing a new thing. Well, who is that? Oh, that's a contractor. You know, allowing the analyst to be able to quickly see that uh, you talked about uh, UI before, Johnny, you're asking that question. You know, having that coordinated investigative workflow uh, where that, that type of context can just be immediately mm -hmm. provided so that you can roll in, roll out, you know, that, that, that additional lighting to the situation is going to be extremely helpful. Yeah, I mean, context is now becoming almost everything because we've got so many different scenarios. You've got to put it into context. Otherwise, yep, it's chaos. But yeah. Another good segue. Thank you so much, uh, and, and thank you so much from 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 Noel. Noel has asked us a question. Noel often asks us questions. Uh, but uh, uh, what well, um, the next slide uh, also talks about? Uh, here we go. Advanced threats, which I think is is where we're getting to with with some yeah. of this is the complexity. But also, as as uh, as, as Noel asks, uh, what is the evolution of these insider threats? So uh, it's almost how do you get a zero day uh, insider threat? I guess. You know, how, where are these threats going, and how do you know uh, that it's not just the way that behaviors are shifting over time versus uh, actually that, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll make something up. Suddenly, uh, people are realizing that uh, uh, photocopying stuff onto Instagram is a really good way of getting data outside the system or, 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 or something like that. So, so how, how do you spot this stuff? I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, and, and I'm, Samir, I'm sure you'll, you may want to chime in as well. What, uh, you know, today's zero day is tomorrow's commodity wear, uh, meaning that uh, there's always going to be a, a marketplace, if you will, for, for malware. And you're always going to have low-hanging fruit where you've got uh, um, bad actors who are taking fairly known vulnerabilities uh, and trying to exploit them with fairly known malware to do so. And they do it because it still works, unfortunately. You know, we still don't patch uh, as much as we need to for a variety of different reasons. Uh, so you're, I think you're always going to have that spectrum of the, the knowns uh, and be able to recognize knowns with scenario-based analytics. Uh, and then there's the rest of the unknown, the true zero day, the true you know, malicious insider where, yeah, you, you really don't have many cues such as a, an IOC or a TTP to go by. You really do have to rely on significant behavioral changes where you can collab, uh, corroborate those changes with concerning activities to mm -hmm. help re uh, really understand the security relevancy of it. So I'm going to shift us on very quickly. We've got four minutes to go. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to shift us on to full spectrum analytics, which is where where the future lies. And uh, this, uh, uh, if one of you two guys could, could talk us through uh, uh, what, what's going on across the top, and you've, you've got a very short amount of time to do so. So uh. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Yeah, so uh, really trying to drive it all home here on, on this slide, right, where we're using our variety of different analytical techniques, uh, whether it's scenario-based or behavior-based, mapped to where we think those behaviors would occur within a, an attack life cycle or you know, a kill chain. The, the importance of doing that is we can now recognize that it's the same user or on the same host where we're seeing these activities to recognize that risk. So when I talk about corro corroboration, this is what I'm referring to where I'm not just looking at one anomaly, I'm looking at an anomaly in that context of what else have we seen from that user from that host to now make an appropriate risk score against that sequence of activities, not just the one activity where we're now potentially laboring an analyst into mm -hmm. looking at a bunch of anomalies that you know ultimately aren't that important to the company. And that's where this is going from this multiple lockouts down to authentication, concurrent, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's seeing that kind of chain of uh, Anomalous that's, behaviors. That's right. You've got you know you know a set amount of activities that we're looking for aligned to reconnaissance and planning that stage. A number of activities looking at uh, that we would associate with that initial compromise stage, and then you know no matter the order, we can then recognize that same user, that same host was involved in uh, multiple stages where the risk priority of that group of activities is increasing, mm -hmm. the farther down that chain it becomes. Uh -huh. the, the, the interesting thing is here, you know, this flowchart looks complicated in and of itself, but actually getting the information that's fed into this flowchart 
is a lot of information and having someone do that themselves is almost impossible, certainly in anything like real time. So that's where the whole automation and computer learning, machine learning really comes into play. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Samir, I'm going to turn to you, and uh, as, as we go into the, the final few minutes, I'm, I'm going to ask you size question. Uh, as as the, the most technical person among us, I'm going to ask you the, the non-technical question, which is about, so okay. how does people and process fit in with this stuff? When you, when you speak to a customer, you've got all the technology, but what do you advise them when it comes to the people aspects and the process aspects? Uh, the, the people aspect, uh, so, uh, one is uh, being um, understand, being able to understand the, the user uh, uh, population in your organization. Uh, who are the users who have the, the high privileges, right? Who is, uh, who is the most uh, uh, the group of people who are the most stressed, right? Uh, to be able to understand your contractors, your partners, uh, understand the, the profile and, and what level of uh, analytics uh, you want on those user, I think uh, become critical. And then from the process point of view, uh, being able to understand your SOC process, how you are gonna respond to insider threat uh, uh, when that were to happen, uh, do you have the playbooks ready? How is that uh, UEBA going to fit in within your uh, SOC practices, right? Uh, uh, what uh, what processes you want to automate? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, who is your SOC free analyst? So I think the whole uh, concept of a threat lifecycle management, uh, being able to understand the people and then the processes become uh, and then very how critical. To respond. Yep. Thank, exactly, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we're, we're on the hour. Uh, Seth, any last words? Any last piece of advice you'd like to offer? Yeah, I, you know, I think your last question about people, process, and technology, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I think if the technology should not be requiring you to be a data scientist, it should be just allowing you to understand your environment, your organization, your scenarios that you're concerned about. And as, as Samir mentioned, having that right playbook to understand the appropriate way to orchestrate the response process. Cool. Tony, last words? Yeah, it's getting that process right because as the saying goes, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So test things, re work on the reactions because the reactions are the really important part, especially the human reactions that need to go in this on the security side, but also on the HR side, the executive side, the public facing side. It's getting mm -hmm. that reaction right and practicing it. So it's think about what's next. It's actually practice what's next. Practice and what's it. next. And in terms of what's next, here's some links for you. You can. Uh, you can tune in and uh, look at the UEBA demo or uh, uh, read Samir's uh, overview of UEBA. And indeed, there's, 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 there's a, a, a SANS analyst paper on logarithm if you're interested. Uh, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to, uh, to our panelists, Samir and Seth from, from Logarithm and, uh, and Tony from Freeform Dynamics. And uh, do tune in next time. Thank you.